Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining me for today's SMIE Consulting Midweek Roundup. I'm your host, Marty Bennett, and today we'll be covering three important topics that we found in international education news over the last seven days. And uh, today, July 3rd, we're celebrating, obviously, the U.S. Women's National Team victory over my, the land of my birth, England, in the Women's World Cup in France. And good luck to the women on Sunday uh, when they'll battle either the Netherlands or Sweden, hoping for a good match then. Uh, going to be a big soccer day on Sunday, so we'll see how, how that all shapes out. But thank you for joining me for this uh, midweek roundup. And as always, uh, we're glad you're here. And uh, we're not sure if Facebook live stream is working today, so uh, we're going to make do with what we have. And we'll soldier on whether uh, you can hear me or not, or you'll catch me on the podcast, I'm sure, for those of you who aren't uh, watching live. Uh, we're going to talk today about three important topics I've seen, uh, a couple of which uh, we've talked in other parts of, uh, of, of these stories before. Uh, but we're going to cover them today, uh, one of which is on China uh, and their increasingly anti-Western efforts uh, to spread their own influence, but also undermine uh, U.S. influence uh, and Western influence, not just U.S., abroad. Uh, we'll also look at how that's impacting directly international education with a uh, recent move uh, to suspend AP testing uh, to Chinese students, uh, Chinese nationals in China. Uh, we'll then shift gears and talk about public education and public universities and their dependence on international students over the last two decades. And we'll also talk about uh, the big dilemma for Indian students now, uh, looking at undergraduate education in the United States. Is it still worth it, worth it for them? So we'll take a look at those three issues today. Uh, thank you for joining me. It's always a pleasure to, to have, uh, have colleagues uh, watching around from around the world uh, these these video sessions that we do. And it's really, uh, for me, uh, this this week I have, uh, obviously there's a lot going on with uh, July 4th holiday, family and friends, uh, a lot of people on vacation. So uh, we're really hoping uh, you'll be able to uh, take some time either alive or, uh, or, or certainly uh, uh, afterwards, uh, hopefully get, get a chance to see what we're doing here and uh, find out how this might be of value to what you do in uh, your institutions or organizations. So thanks again for joining me. Uh, I've shared the links to uh, both the SMIE e-newsletter that comes out uh, on Mondays. That's our, uh, all the SMIE news fit to share. And that's where the stories that I cover here on Wednesday during the midweek roundup come from. Uh, this free newsletter service is available to uh, anyone uh, in international education uh, who would like to get uh, these stories, about 10 to 15 international ed stories and four or five social media stories each week. Uh, package those up into a newsletter that comes to your inbox on Monday mornings. And then Wednesday of that week, uh, we pick three of those stories and take a deeper dive into how they might impact what you do in your own international ed offices. Now, um, we also have a link to our SMI Consulting uh, website uh, that has a lot of great free resources like, the, like these podcasts and uh, live chats, like the newsletter uh, presentations that I've been, uh, been part of over the last, uh, last few years, and other resources that we hope that you'll find of use to your, you and your institution or organization. Now, uh, let's first start with, with the issue of China. Uh, now, the Washington Post, as anyone in, uh, who follows uh, politics closely uh, knows, is not a bastion of uh, conservative thought uh, by any, any stretch. Uh, but this, uh, there's a global opinion column this past week of China's efforts to undermine democracy are expanding worldwide. Uh, we've covered pieces of what this story talks about uh, in relation to the Belt and Road Initiative, which is over a trillion dollar uh, impacts on countries in uh, South, and South Asia and Africa, uh, but also into Latin America and Europe. Uh, the, China has spread influence in other ways uh, through economic uh, aggression, as the article called it, uh, math, mixed influence operations, trying to exert influence on these countries. Uh, and then there's a new study by the International Republican Institute that examines Beijing's strategy in 13 countries. Uh, and the article says it warns that China's worldwide campaign now represents a clear and significant threat to U.S. strategic and economic interests. 
Um, so it's talking specifically about what the Chinese Communist Party is doing on a unique set of tactics, economic and information uh, domains that uh, undermines uh, many developing countries, democratic institutions, and future prosperity as their, uh, their, their prosperity grows, uh, with China, depending on China. So we're talking really today about uh, different pieces of the puzzle for international education, how these, how these pieces fit together. Uh, we're talking, um, we look at some of the examples that the article goes into, Malaysia and Sri Lanka. Uh, recently, Beijing-friendly governments were thrown out, uh, but the successors in those two countries were still saddled with Chinese projects and Chinese debt. Uh, and that's uh, as part, part of the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, massive infrastructure projects around the world in developing countries uh, that uh, make those countries somewhat beholden to, uh, to China. So interesting article that talks about what that looks like. Uh, now, the direct impact on uh, international education is, is really not felt uh, through the confines of, that, of the economic pieces, but what we do see is something uh, that popped in uh, a Reuters article uh, that we've seen come across inside higher ed and Chronicle as well, and that has to do with uh, China suspending uh, some AP history tests for U.S. college credit by 2020. Uh, now, this is basically what College Board offers, uh, AP exams, uh, will hit secondary school students yeah, according to the article, looking to ease the academic world workload at U.S. institutions by 2020, uh, that they would suspend their five testing centers in China, Beijing, Guangzhou, Nanjing, Shanghai, uh, and I think there must be two in either Beijing or, Guang or Shanghai. Uh, there, uh, it's a bit sudden, uh, according to the test centers that are being told this, uh, that uh, the tests that are affected are U.S. history, world history, European history and human geography. And these are um, the Chinese body that is authorized to administer the exams. Uh, the uh, China's Minister of Education has not been, has not responded specifically to this uh, request for information from Reuters in this case uh, for comment. Uh, the officials at these AP test centers declined to comment on the reason for the ban, uh, but they would follow it. <laughs> they follow their decline. They follow the ban uh, that's been handed down to avoid punitive measures in terms of not being able to do any testing whatsoever. Uh, so what's uh, uh, really the focus is here on these history courses, uh, these Western history uh, taught car um, Western curriculum, basically, uh, that are now uh, going to be banned in. Uh, in, in China for its uh, nationals to operate, uh, to take. Uh, so, and that's really means the curriculum as well. So is this perhaps just a reaction to uh, Trump's attempts to uh, play the increasingly uh, antagonistic role with China on the trade war and other, other areas? So uh, there, there's sort of been mixed signals on this front. Uh, that uh, Chinese students have been over the past year, particularly those that are looking at STEM, have come under increased scrutiny for visas, for renewals, and that certainly uh, pops on the radar too. Uh, and now not just uh, uh, certainly visa delays for, for, for people coming back, that's been a big, big significant piece of the puzzle here. Um, but now we're seeing uh, perhaps a different tone taken. Uh, the recent summits uh, uh, President Trump uh, attended and had, had meetings with uh, uh, President Xi in China, of China, that's, uh, there, there was a much softer line on Chinese students and, in fact, uh, kind of including Chinese students in what uh, he had proposed as part of a larger immigration reform package uh, by uh, um, saying that there needs to be clear pathways for these students to uh, carry on, continue on uh, to citizen, potential citizenship, uh, employment and citizenship. So it's be interesting to see where that goes, that there needs to be smart person uh, visas <laughs> or waivers given to these individuals to ease their transition to, uh, to potential citizenship and permanent residency. So wondering uh, where all that's going to go. Uh, so that's, a, that's definitely want to keep an eye on if these kind of things expand to uh, a more, um, a broader scale beyond just uh, AP tests. So we'll, we'll see what happens with that. Now one, one piece here 
one story here that's uh, shifting gears now and talking directly about public universities. Uh, it's a story that um, has been touched on uh, largely by the Chronicle, uh, to a lesser extent by Inside Higher Ed over the past few years, uh, related to, uh, to how public universities have really become dependent on international students uh, for um, uh, over fixing or uh, making up for revenue shortfalls that, that they're feeling from the states, uh, the, the states around the country. Uh, that they are uh, beholden to for an increasingly smaller share of their operating budget each year. So Karen, uh, Karen uh, Fisher at The Chronicle, uh, for those of you who haven't uh, also started following her newsletter uh, called Latitudes uh, that she, uh, she puts in, I've just posted the link to the article on the Facebook page. Uh, it's called The Hooked on Tuition Edition, Why U.S. Higher Education Public Funding Problems Are Tied to International Students. And it's more than a decade on from the Great Recession now, and that's uh, uh, per edu student education appropriations, according to the state higher ed finance report, uh, suggests that in 2018, uh, those per student appropriations are $1,000 below their pre-recession levels. So uh, state, ed state funding has clearly dropped. Uh, so what we're talking here, uh, public colleges, uh, they have, uh, in nearly half the states, they increase net tuition revenue per student by 25% or more. So who are these students that were footing the bill? Uh, out of state is an obvious answer, uh, but increasingly those have been uh, overseas students. Uh, and uh, she references a study I've talked about here on the, podca on the podcast before, uh, that uh, University of Michigan found a 10% decrease in state appropriations was tied to a 12% increase in foreign enrollments at public research universities. So uh, at flagship and research intensive institutions, according to Karen, uh, that are members of the Association of American Universities, the impact is even greater. Uh, enrollments increased 17%. Uh, so this is clearly um, an offsetting measure uh, that the public universities have, uh, have undertaken over the last uh, decade, decade and a half to offset uh, the increasing cuts to their uh, their state appropriations. So um, now, with and if there is another economic downturn coming, uh, should, are colleges still going to be able to rely on international tuition to plug the holes? And this is going to be something we certainly want to uh, want want to take uh, take. Uh, Take and take a closer eye, look, eye to because these are the kinds of issues that will will impact what we do in international education and uh, how these institutions, public institutions, state institutions in the U.S. that have uh, relied on international student recruitment, over overly committing themselves to one country or another, uh, as we've seen in a few colleges, particularly in the Big Ten. Uh, we'll see where where that goes. So definitely want to keep an eye on in terms of what happens with that. So I uh, definitely wanted to, to watch. Um, and in terms of the last topic that I'll cover today, uh, and this is one that is a, a little bit closer to home because uh, these are the kinds of stories, uh, again, stories I always pay a little bit more attention to kind of trends I see in stories that aren't necessarily international ed related uh, that in terms of the, who, the authors of these stories. Uh, particularly when you get local news outlets or other, other uh, non-education focused articles, really, when, they're, when they start to tackling international ed issues. And this one here is from uh, CNBC TV 18. Uh, not sure on the exact uh, location of this. This actually may be an Indian specific one, uh, but we're not, not too sure on that, uh, that, that specific piece, but the article itself focuses on Indian undergraduate students that are considering uh, study in the United States for their bachelor's degree. Uh, so the article focuses on uh, many students believe that studying in the U.S. culminates in the possibility for better employment options. This is something we've talked about many times on uh, the on the podcast, the Midweek Roundup, and certainly um, India uh, is perhaps the most hypersensitive country to those uh, changes or potential changes or even tweets about changes to uh, OPT, STEM OPT, H1B processing. All of these things are 
get a laser eye focus from uh, from folks in India. Um, but uh, the, the, I mean, the numbers from India have been growing. Uh, the number of Indian students in the U.S. has doubled in the last 10 years, uh, but the growth rate has slowed. And whenever you hear those stories, when I leave with that, the slowing growth, then it's, the, the point is it's still growing, but it's just not growing as fast. And it makes it sound like it's, oh my gosh, the, the roof's on fire. Uh, but this one uh, looks at the increase this past year was only 5.4% uh, from a year ago. Um, and then the focus is again on the slowing growth. But what's, what's happening uh, from the Indian perspective? Uh, the, uh, there, this, this, the article itself makes me think it's more and more it's, it's coming from an Indian perspective here. Because uh, it looks, takes, talks, takes it into account the rising, why, why are things changing? It looks at the rising costs of attending American universities as well as political uncertainty caused by the uh, current administration. Uh, and this is, this is something that looks particularly at uh, the t cost of tuition at U.S., particularly private institutions in this survey. Uh, private universities are, are seen, and that makes me uh, almost guarantee this is an Indian article here, at the top 18 American universities are all private according to the U.S. News rankings. And I don't know if necessarily that's true, uh, but certainly uh, the majority are uh, certainly top of where these students, international students study, are not all exclusively um, in the top 18 are not exclusively private. Uh, a great number of them are, are public institutions. So there are the private universities that they, they look at are the top 18 on the U.S. news list. This is the MITs, the Yales, the Harvards, the Ivies, and Stanfords and such. Uh, the average cost of attending a private university uh, is um, for these schools is Seventy-six thousand dollars a year. Uh, top, and this is just for the tuition. Uh, so that would that is, is taking the, uh, the these amounts uh, again. I'm looking at elite universities in the United States. So uh, this is where uh, kind of when you compare undergraduate education in rupees, they're basically comparing when they do a comparison to the UK, Canada, Singapore, Australia, Hong Kong, and, and India, uh, looking at the annual. Uh, undergraduate education fees uh, for tuition uh, in these countries, uh, Austria, uh, U.S. is well above uh, the, uh, the, the the competition next uh, in, in rupees, uh, 25, uh, 2.5 million rupees roughly for the U.S. per year to uh, 15 million rupees for uh, uh, 1.5 million rupees for uh, 2.5 to 1.5 from the U.S. to Australia for the top two on that list. Again, they're looking at uh, just these top 18 universities. So uh, obviously that's something that we, we take a look at. Took a look, take a look at those numbers from just the top 18 in the U.S. versus uh, everyone in Australia. You're probably going to yeah, see a, a tremendous range uh, discrepancy there. For the, uh, it would make the U.S. look a whole lot more expensive than they actually are. The truth of the matter is uh, there are so many quality institutions, particularly at the undergraduate level in the United States, where Indian students can come and get exceptional education opportunities and placement into, into graduate schools uh, at, uh, that would cost nowhere, nowhere near that amount uh, of 76,000 rupees a year, or $76,000 per year. So uh, the challenges also are impacted on the visa side. Uh, is and thinking that that was going to be a potential difference is the reality is uh, if you're not looking at graduate programs, uh, Indian undergraduates have actually been increasing to the United States in the past uh, couple of years, uh, not at the volume uh, that as are on the graduate side, but you see have seen significant drops in the graduate population from India coming in the last two years, new, new internationals coming in the last two years. There's still plenty of Indians in the OPT cycle and STEM OPT cycle that will be here for another couple of years, but those numbers will probably decline. Uh, so we're looking. We look at what's what's happening now. Is that uh, uh, the H one? They look at visa denials for H one Bs uh, as as increasing for uh, for, uh, for for Indian professionals wanting to go direct to the U S to work on an H one B. Coincidentally, the the numbers will be shifting in. The favor of Indians who have come for advanced degrees, particularly masters or above, 
to finish uh, to apply for OPT and H-1B. So that, those are things that I think uh, there are a lot of waves that come and go in India when it comes to where, where, where parents and students are with where they want to go for their education. Uh, the UK seems to have rebounded. Canada has certainly taken a, a, a big jump in the last couple of years in terms of Indian population. In fact, I think it's their number one population now. Uh, so we're, lo we lo we're looking at uh, a lot of ups and downs in, the, in who's hot and when. Uh, India is uh, probably the most, uh, s most susceptible to these changes. So it'll be interesting to see where th those go in, in the weeks to come. Uh, but uh, there's certainly, uh, I think, the U.S. companies and Indian U.S. companies have spent, uh, on, on the international ed side, frankly, have spent quite a bit of time over the last, uh, last decade uh, really infusing uh, their uh, business models uh, of undergraduate recruitment tours, uh, a number of which uh, I've had the pleasure of uh, knowing and uh, knowing the folks who run them and actually being on a couple of them. Uh, whether it's the CIS, Linden, which have been the bigger players for years, but uh, that have done undergraduate recruitment tours there. But you now see uh, uh, folks like Gen Next, KIC Unit Assist, uh, Simple Ed, doing a number of different kinds of tours from a very small group of one to two up to large groups of 2025 20, institutions traveling together recruiting at Indian undergraduate uh, or high schools uh, recruiting undergraduate students. So we'll see where the, these changes go in India. Obviously, a huge, diverse market and one that's changing fairly quickly. Uh, so we really look look to the future uh, in India as one that's going to be uh, continually evolving, and uh, uh, one that we know is uh, remarkably susceptible to what's happening uh, with uh, with news and events that uh, hit, the, hit the hit our Twitter feeds and news feeds around the world. So I do want to say thank you again for joining us. Uh, for those who uh, listen on the podcast, thank you. And thank you for commenting on the, for, for, for those of you who've uh, downloaded the podcast and are listening to them on your commutes or during your work life. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, it certainly means a lot knowing that you're doing that. And those watching on, on, on the replays on YouTube or on the Facebook page, thanks again for spending your time with us. And we look forward to more of these, and we'll see you again soon. Have a great weekend, and uh, happy Fourth of July.